Before we continue our examination into the remaining little house books by Laura Ingalls Wilder, I thought it was important to stop and take a look at the young adult category and put the remaining books into the context of both the history of YA and contemporary attitudes about the genre. As a writer of young adult fiction myself, I tend to focus on the positive attributes of the category, but not everyone shares this opinion. Take a look at this quotation, for example. The teenage book, it seems to me, is a phenomenon which belongs properly only to a society of morons. Although this passage dates from 1965, it isn't an outdated criticism especially in the wake of Harry Potter, the Twilight series, the Hunger Games, and the many series books that have popped up in the last 10 to 15 years. I want to focus briefly on the Harry Potter series because it truly transformed contemporary children's literature in general and YA specifically. In the year 2000, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban was nominated for Britain's prestigious Whitbread Book Prize. It went head-to-head -head with Seamus Haney's translation of Beowulf, which was considered an adult book and a literary masterwork. Harry lost, and instead was named the Whitbread Children's Book of the Year. The difference between the adult book and the children's book Whitbread Prize was significant, and signaled perhaps the different value society attached to an adult book versus a children's book. Haney won 21,000 pounds for the Whitbread Prize. Rowling won 10,000 pounds for the Whitbread Children's Award. And at about the same time, the New York Times established a separate bestseller list for children's titles. Why? Because the first three titles in the Harry Potter series had bumped the so-called adult titles. It raised the question of whether a book marketed primarily for young readers but also successful with adults is a less laudable achievement than a successful book targeted primarily at adults. Children's literature scholars sense the recurrence of a long-standing prejudice, the notion that even a highly regarded and phenomenally successful children's book could not be measured against critically acclaimed books for adults. If a book targeted to children was being read by adults, then surely, some critics claimed, we had become a society of morons. According to William Sapphire of the New York Times, awarding any Harry Potter book an adult literary prize would constitute the infantilization of adult culture, the loss of a sense of what a classic really is. In fact, he maintained, Reading a Harry Potter book is more than a little waste of adult time. In yet another column, this one entitled Adult Fair, Harry Potter is Not, he again attacked the whole notion of adults reading children's books. Here's how one children's book author summarized the column. His rather circular argument was that children's books, as everyone knows, are without depth and texture and serious messages of good adult fiction. Except, of course, his favorites, Huckleberry Finn, The Wizard of Oz, and Alice in Wonderland, which aren't children's books at all, because he likes them and they have depth and texture. All of which reminds me of Ursula Le Guin's observation about the apparent ease of writing for children. All you do is take the sex out and use short words and dumb ideas, and don't be too scary, and be sure there's a happy ending, right? nothing to it. If you do all that, you might even write Jonathan Livingston Seagull and make twenty million dollars and have every adult in America reading your book. But you won't have every kid in America reading your book. They will look at it and they will see straight through it with their clear, cold, beady little eyes and they will put it down and they will go away. Kids devour vast amounts of garbage, and it is good for them, but they are not like adults. They have not learned to eat plastic. 
What Le Guin has identified here is another common assumption about children's books, that they're easy to write and intended for an immature and unsophisticated audience. Le Guin's implication, of course, is that young readers are, in fact, a very, very tough audience. The late children's book author Madeline Lingle agreed, nothing makes a serious writer of children's books hotter around the collar than the assumption that you write for children because it's easier or because you can't make it in the adult field. You write for children on significant topics if you're a serious writer because children are willing to accept theological and philosophical concepts that the adult will not accept. Children are willing to go into the world of darkness that is on the other side of critical fact with open minds. They're still brave. They still have courage. Children don't eat or read plastic. I want to come back to this in a moment, the idea of sophistication in young readers and, by extension, young adults. But this passage from Langle touches on two other common assumptions about children's book writers and young adult writers. That young adult writers are apprentice writers, not quite ready for prime time. Those of us who write for young readers often field questions like these. When are you going to write a real book for adults? Or are you writing for children until you're good enough to write a real book for grown-ups? And behind these questions lurks this assumption. People who write for kids do it because they're not good enough to write real books for adults. The assumption is that kids are dumb and immature. Writers who write for kids must therefore be dumb and immature too. Most of us who write for children, even such writers as Le Ingle and Le Guin, who write successfully for both, know better than that. Good writing is good writing. Good books are good books, whether they're intended for an adult audience or young readers. To quote again from Madeline Le Ingle, if a book is not good enough for a grown-up, it is not good enough for a child. This is true whether you're talking about a picture book, an easy to read, a middle grade, or a young adult novel. In fact, most writers who write for young readers agree with J.K. Rowling when she said, I never thought about writing for children. Children's books chose me. It's a kind of calling, perhaps, the desire to write for young readers. It's often unconscious, natural, and instinctive. It often seems like the most gifted authors of books for children are not like other writers. Instead, in some essential way, they are children themselves. There may be outward signs of this condition. These people may prefer the company of boys and girls to that of adults. They read children's books and play children's games and like to dress up and pretend to be someone else. They are impulsive, dreamy, imaginative, unpredictable. From my own experience, I can tell you that not all children's book writers fit Alison Murray's description. But many do feel some kind of bond with their past, their childhood, and adolescence. And this connection isn't just some kind of idealized past full of nostalgia. Most children's book writers keenly feel the pain and loss and conflict of childhood, as well as its joys. Because again, as Lurie points out, their books are, in the deepest sense, subversive. As writers, they make fun of adults and expose adult pretensions and failings. They suggest, subtly or otherwise, that children are braver, smarter, and more interesting than grown-ups, and that grown-ups' rules are made to be broken. Which touches on one last common assumption about writing for young readers, that the best books should always teach children and young adults to be good and responsible citizens to conform to social norms and expectations, to prize family and cultural values. In short, children's books should be didactic. They should preach. 
or at least teach. And as we discussed in part one of this class, in the beginning, at least in the United States, many early children's books did just that. But did children like them? Not necessarily. Certainly, young adult fiction deals with serious themes, and some writers indeed seem intent on telling readers what to think about the world. C.S. Lewis's Narnia tales, for example, make very clear distinctions between good and evil. So too does Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. We think we are teachers as much as artists. So there is certainly a strong didacticism in books for young readers, but again, as Alison Lurie points out, boys and girls are not always interested in becoming responsible adults. They also often like books that anxious adults would consider scary or immoral or both, books in which creepy things happen, and there is often no poetic or any other justice. In fact, this may partially explain the popularity of Rowling's Harry Potter series. Think about it. Are Harry and his friends model children? Don't they break rules, disobey orders, and conceal their behavior from adults? This, in fact, is one of the great traditions in both children's and young adult literature. Tom Sawyer and his friends drink, smoke tobacco, swear, and play truant from school. In The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy refuses to do housework for the Wicked Witch of the West, and Mary Lennox in The Secret Garden disobeys and deceives adults, finding her way not only into the Forbidden Garden, but into the room of her invalid cousin Colin, whose existence has been concealed from her. Books like these do not present their child characters as perfect and obedient, but as curious, independent, and enterprising. So in many ways, writing for children, and especially writing for young adults, is essentially about subversion and curiosity. But this hasn't always been the case, as we discussed in part one, when we examined middle grade fiction. A great deal of American literature for children originated in a totally different genre. In fact, much of it sprang from didactic religious stories. Children in the 1840s read religious magazines, such as The Sabbath School Visitor or The Child's Companion. And in much of this literature, particularly in the 1830s and 1840s, the stories featured sentimental plots and deathbed conversions and illness, even physical dismemberment and early death. Here's just one more example from literature from this period and the genre, a preface to one children's story. You have in this little volume the biography of six Sunday school pupils who were early called away from the world. They were happy and beloved whilst they lived and deeply lamented when they died. Obviously, lots of things in American children's literature changed dramatically. And for writers who work now in the field of children's and young adult literature, a big change, a radical change. And it began to surface shortly after the American Civil War in the 1860s, this shift affected not just literature, but childhood as well. Before the American Civil War, people were simply considered either children or adults. Then there was an awakening, a recognition that there was some kind of transition, an important transition between childhood and adulthood. And this transition relates specifically to one book, Little Women, published in 1868. This is the first American YA novel. Note the significance of the title, Little Women, not Little Girls, not Women or Ladies, but Little Women, a recognition of a transition between childhood and adulthood. Another important point here. Despite its focus on Pilgrim's progress in the early chapters of the book, 
Little Women is essentially a secular story. The March girls have interesting lives and an emotional range well beyond what was typical in children's literature of the period. This book also, and this may surprise contemporary readers, contained an undercurrent of subversion, a characteristic we now associate with young adult fiction. Many authors of the late 19th and well into the early 20th century insisted on making their girls good and domestic and dull. If a heroine were allowed some freedom to roam outside the home, she soon regretted it or grew up, whichever came first. This description certainly does not apply to Jo March of Little Women, who never completely settles down. Even her marriage at the end of the novel defies convention. The late 19th century also produced one other young adult classic in the United States, and it too was steeped in subversion. Mark Twain's The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, published in 1884. It was perceived as a scandalous book, not because of its racial underpinnings, but because of its inherent immorality. While I do not wish to state it as my opinion that the book is absolutely immoral in tone, still it seems to me that it contains but very little humor, and that little is of a very coarse type. If it were not for the author's reputation, the book would undoubtedly meet with severe criticism. I regard it as the veriest trash. Incidentally, Louisa May Alcott, author of Little Women, didn't like it either. If Mr. Clemens cannot think of something better to tell our pure-minded lads and lasses, he had best stop writing for them. <laughs>